we read stories of people gaining awakening while listening to the Dharma, especially while listening to the Dharma from the Buddha. And we wonder if it had everything to do with the fact that the Buddha was the one giving the talk. But as he said, it also had to do with the person listening. He said, this can be with any talk. If you bring these five qualities to the talk, there's the opportunity that you can, as he said, alight on the Dhamma. The five qualities are these. One, you don't despise the speaker. Two, you don't despise the talk. Three, you don't despise yourself. Four, your mind is one-pointed and not scattered. And five, you apply appropriate attention. The first three about not despising, those are important because when you despise something, you put up a barrier. You decide, I'm not going to listen to this person's talk, or I, I don't like the topic of the talk. You can't really take the talk in. And you're not really giving yourself over to, well, what is it actually saying? You're putting an interpretive filter on there, and it's a pretty bad one, too. And John Swatt talks about how he would listen to a John Tate's Dhamma talks. Now, he'd had many issues with the John Tate in the past, but he still liked listening to John Tate's Dhamma talks. He said he found he could get his mind to settle down very quickly, regardless of the fact that John Tate had done some things that a John Swatt didn't respect. I had a similar experience. There was a monk in Thailand who I'd learned not to respect just by watching his behavior. But he gave really good Dharma talks, and I found that my mind can get into strong concentration listening to it. So don't let the speaker get in the way, or don't let your opinion of the speaker get in the way. And the same with the topic. Sometimes it may be a very simple topic, but it may be precisely what you need. If you decide, well, this topic is beneath me, then you don't open yourself up to hearing it again and hearing it from a new angle, learning something new about it and also learning something new about yourself in the process. And finally, not despising yourself. If you keep telling yourself, I'm not capable of doing this, that right there is a block. So when the Dharma talk is about what's going on in the human mind, in the human mind, <clears throat> you remind yourself, okay, I've got a human mind. It's not that different from other people's minds. The details may be different, but the basic structure is all the same. So maybe there's something here I can learn, something here I can master. Now to master it, you have to have that quality of one-pointedness of mind and bring appropriate attention. The word here, egaka sometimes translated as one-pointedness, but aga here doesn't necessarily mean point. It's like the tip of a mountain or the ridge of a roof, the topmost part of something. It can also mean gathering place, the place where monks used to gather for the obosita, and where they still gather for the obosita, and Pali is called an obostaga, where they gather for meals is called a pataga. And so egaka means one place where you gather. And sometimes your one point is meaning that your mind is just totally one point. You're aware of only one point, to the point where you're not aware of your body, maybe, or not aware of sounds. But obviously the Buddha is not talking about that here. If you, your mind is so one point you can't hear the sounds, and you're not going to hear the Dharma talk. So it's more likely to mean it's all gathered around what the talk is all about. You're not paying attention to anything else, and your mind is not scattered in other places. It's right there with the talk. And finally, appropriate attention. It means basically you bring the questions of the Four Noble Truths to bear. Okay, where is the st stress here? And not in the talk, of course. Where is the stress in my mind as I'm listening to the talk? What's the cause of stress? How does the talk help illuminate my understanding of where the stress is and what's causing the stress? Or what qualities I can develop? so that my mind gets on the path to the end of stress, so I can realize the cessation of stress. So you're looking both at your own mind and you're listening to the talk at the same time and applying appropriate attention to both. How does this talk illuminate these issues? And once they're illuminated, how do they apply to my mind? 
That's how those people listening to the Dharma talks in the past were able to gain awakening, because they didn't leave it just at the words. There's a term in Pali, bada bada which means basically, at best, just the words. In other words, people who listen to the talk, and that's all it is, it's just words to them. But if you decide to take those words and use them to point to things going on in your mind, and it's your choice. The speaker may be sitting there pointing, pointing, pointing at what's going on in your mind, but if you decide not to point at things going on in your mind, the talk will go right past you. But if you point those words at what's going on in your mind, you allow them to point, you allow them to come into the mind, to illuminate what's going on, or illumine what's going on in the mind, and you find your benefit. You're able to step back from things happening in the mind and see them in a new light. Because we tend to, as a John Swite used to say, see suffering as our enemy, so we push it away and don't want to look at it. We see craving as our friend, we bring it on. But if we learn to see it, a craving is actually causing the stress and suffering. You begin to realize a craving is not your friend. It's something you want to abandon. As for stress, you make it your friend to the extent that you want to comprehend it, find out about it. So eventually you can go past it. In a way you're kind of acting like a con man befriending something that you want to get rid of or something that you want to get past. But in this case, it doesn't matter. The suffering is not a person that you're cheating. You want to get to know it really well, really intimately, so that you can figure out, okay, what is this and what am I doing? It's not that your awareness of the suffering is one thing and the suffering is just kind of coming in at you without your having participated. You're participating in the suffering and creating it. So you want to see that. So you've got to get intimate with that so you realize, okay, this is really part of me. Part of me is in there. It's going to require abandoning part of you, but you have to recognize what it is. Now all these qualities apply not only to listening to the Dharma, but also to when you're practicing concentration. This is why listening to the Dharma and practicing at the same time go together, like, as I say in Pali, like milk and water. The two activities are right there together, developing and depending on the same qualities of mind. You don't want to despise the person who t taught the meditation topic, i.e. the Buddha, and you don't despise the topic of the concentration. In this case, it's the breath. You don't sit there saying, well, I'm going to stick with the breath as long as only as long as I have to and so I can get on to something better. You want to pay careful attention to the breath. Don't despise it. Or as that chat we had just now said, you have respect for your concentration. It means having respect for your object. The breath in particular is a really good object to work with because it has a huge impact on your body and a huge impact on your mind. And as you begin to explore, you begin to realize. The way you breathe, the way the breath energy moves in the body. If left to its own devices, it's pretty random, but if you learn how to take it on as a skill, then it can take you someplace. And as with any skill, you have to learn how to respect your materials. It's like being a carpenter. You have to have respect for your wood, understand what wood is all about, just instead of just trying to push the wood into the shape that you want. You realize that other times you have to cut it like this, other times you have to cut it like that. You have to make allowances for the fact that it's going to expand and contract. And different types of wood and different grains of wood are useful for different parts of whatever you want to build. In other words, you really pay careful attention to the wood. You show respect to the wood in that case, and that, and that enables you to become a master of the wood. It's the same with the breath. You want to have respect for the in fact, this is something that has a huge impact on the mind, so you want to really look carefully at what it's doing, what you can make it do, what you can't make it do, and have some respect for the property of concentration in and of itself, in the sense of having a mind that's just still. All too often the mind achieves a little bit of stillness and you get impatient and say, well, what's next? 
You have to learn to see stillness itself is also a skill. And in this case, that impatience, what's next, is what you have to abandon. That's the voice you have to learn not to listen to. Of course, to do all this, you have to have some respect for yourself, your own ability to get the mind to settle down. And if it's not settling down, you can, you have to take heart from the fact there have been people in the past who have had difficulties, but they were able to do it finally. And whether it's a skill that comes easily or a skill that comes hard, it's a skill you've got to master. And fortunately, it's something human beings can do. This is where that element of conceit that Ananda talked about is useful. Other people can do this. They're human beings. I'm a human being. I can do it too. You've got to have that attitude. Otherwise, you put up a barrier, that, that barrier of dis despising, i.e. despising yourself in this case. You make it impossible for yourself to do it. So you've got to have some confidence that this is a skill you can master. Now, it may take some more time, and in our culture we tend to be extremely impatient. I was reading the other day that there are a lot of people who, if they have to wait more than two seconds for a video to download onto their device, they, they give up. Well, concentration is going to take more than two seconds. Sometimes it takes two years to figure it out. Sometimes it takes even more. But it's one of those skills that you have to develop regardless of whether it comes easily or not. So you need to keep your spirits buoyed up. Keep yourself confident that this is something you can do. Then, of course, there's that quality of agaka of having the mind gathered into one around the object. In fact, that's the definition of concentration, the one-gatheredness of the mind. And then finally, appropriate attention. This is where the Buddha says, once the mind has been gathered solidly and you're good at it, then you start analyzing it in terms of the Four Noble Truths. You begin to realize this concentration state that you've got going here is composed of aggregates. And as long as you're clinging to it, that's going to be suffering something you need to comprehend. Up to this point you've been simply developing it, but now you've got to comprehend it. Which means understanding it from the point of view of what's the perception here, what's the thought construct, what's the feeling here, and then seeing these things as things that are worthy of dispassion. Now you don't want to do this too quickly. If you do it too quickly, then you lose the foundation and concentration you need in order to help pry your attachments away from other things. In fact, while you're developing the concentration, you want to hold on to it. And at that point, the clinging is not a problem, because you use the concentration to pry away your attachment to sensual desires, sensuality in general, i.e. the mind's fascination with making sensual plans for sensual pleasures. But there comes a point where you've got to turn on the concentration itself. See, this is something not only to develop, now it's developed to the point where now you have to learn how to comprehend it to the point of dispassion so you can abandon your attachment to it. And that's what enables you to, as the Buddha would say, a light on the drama. You take apart the intention and the attention that are keeping the concentration going. You take apart your attachment to the perception. And the concentration gets more and more refined, and finally get to the point where there's some of the question of what do you do now, and you have to learn not to do anything at all. No intention one way or the other, either, either to stay or to go. Now you can see that in concentration. And the reason you see it is because you've been applying appropriate intention. Because you realize that even staying in concentration at that point has an element of stress. Going someplace else in concentration has stress as well. The only alternative is neither to stay nor to go. That's the riddle that appropriate attention takes you to. And it's in this way that practicing concentration does help you gain awakening. As the Buddha said, a light on the Dhamma. So it's the same set of qualities. 
that you should bring to listening to a Dharma talk. You should also bring it to listening to your concentration, developing it, analyzing it. So eventually you can go beyond it. Because in both cases, the talk and the concentration are there to be used and then put aside. So if you bring the proper attitudes and the proper qualities of mind, both to the listening and to the concentration, you find that they really do give great benefits. So look inside yourself and see which attitudes and qualities are missing and bring them into line. This is not necessarily have the Buddha sitting here talking to you. For you to see the Dharma. The Dharma is there to be seen all the time. Simply that you have to develop the right eye to see it.